Hello. Um, it's great to be here. I don't want to go on for too long because I know quite a lot of you just want to go out and get drunk as far as I know. I am looking at Ellie Mayo Hagen in particular over there. Um, but it's interesting speaking here because I joined Twitter just over two years ago. And I was very reluctant at first to join Twitter. I remember thinking it was the sort of thing kind of self-indulgent people did. They'd tweet, they'd go out and get drunk and tweet, oh, I'm really pissed, Lolcano. Uh, I love my mates, Rafflecopter. And indeed, if you look at Sonny Hundle's Twitter feed after he's had a few too many shandies, that is what Twitter can be. Um, I believe Hundled was considered for the Oxford English Dictionary, actually, i.e. you got really Hundled over your Twitter feed last night, though I, I don't believe they've accepted it yet, but we're working on it. But in other ways, I joined it because I was angry about the government that came to power at the last election, and it was a substitute for ranting at the TV, though I suppose in a way Twitter is often a collective ranting at the television. But since then I've come to appreciate just how important social media is for people on the left. Because we're up against the media, which is, on the whole, institutionally hostile to everything that we believe in. It's hostile to threats to a status quo that it is part of, to working people fighting back for their rights and the trade unions that represent them, and to alternative visions of running the world. And with the support of the media, this government has very effectively redirected people's anger from the people at the top who caused this crisis to people's neighbours down the street, the working poor against the unemployed over benefits, the non-disabled against the disabled again over benefits, private sector workers against public sector workers over pensions, the politics of divide and rule. And at the same time, they've hammered into all of us as best they can this idea there is no alternative to austerity. So I just want to talk quickly about what I think social media can do in that sort of environment. Firstly, it can give a platform to voices which are all but airbrushed out of existence by the mainstream press. Now I know Sue Marsh is in the room, I'm going to embarrass her now. Where is she? Wave your hand, Sue. There you go, she's right at the back. Now, Sue Marsh is an example of someone, and I'm very proud uh, to be in the same room talking about this with Sue here. She's someone who was forced onto the top of the agenda, the rights of disabled people who are being forced to pay for a crisis they had absolutely nothing to do with. Uh, I think particularly, for example, of the Spartacist report, or hashtag Spartacist report, which showed the misrepresentation of disabled people in this country. But I also want to give an example, just in terms of how social media gives a platform to people, otherwise airbrushed out of existence. And I want to mention Karen Sherlock. Karen was a disabled woman who was found capable of work by the DWP. Uh, her employment and support allowance was limited to a year. That's happening to people right across the country. She was left terrified of her future. She died earlier this month of a cardiac arrest. And as Sue said on a blog, and now she's dead, and she died in fear because the system failed her, because cruel men refused to listen and powerful men refused to act. These are stories which are happening right across the country, but no one in the mainstream press has any interest in showing what's actually happening to people. That is a role that social media can provide to remind people who caused this crisis and who's been made to pay for it, to show the reality of this crisis for ordinary people's lives. The second thing media, uh, that social media can do is often show the distortions of the mainstream press. Now, if we go way back to the 1980s, the miners' strike in the 1980s, a, a seismic uh, turning point in the history of this country, the defeat and what it represented. But I'll give you an example. There was this uh, huge, um, iconic moment, the Battle of Orgreave. Now, what the mainstream press did, the BBC in particular, is they made it look like the miners had charged the police, that they were the aggressors, when in reality the police had charged the miners and later were forced to cough up compensation. In the era of social media, it becomes so much more difficult for the media to get away with things like that. You've got an army of people standing there with their iPhones. You can instantly put that on Twitter and on their blogs. It challenges that attempt, if you like, by the people at the top to distort what's actually really happening. But of course, equally, what's so important about social media is forcing issues onto the agenda, which the mainstream press has no intention 
of uh, looking at at all, including alternatives to austerity, for example. I think of what Clifford has done so brilliantly with false economy, for example, showing what's actually happening because of austerity and actually looking at alternatives. And that gives all of us, it's not an abstract intellectual exercise, it gives all of us the confidence to fight back, to break down our biggest enemy, which is resignation among people that there is no alternative. And that is exactly, without social media uh, and the brilliant efforts of Clifford, we won't be able to do that. And others. And others, sorry. I won't just idolise Clifford, though he is pretty cool, so, you know. But also, what's important is we have to remember that we're not just the sum of our avatars. We are, and we should be, linked to a far broader movement. We shouldn't be isolated from the struggles going on around us. We're sitting here today in Congress House, and despite the battering the trade unions have received over the last generation, they remain the biggest democratic movement in this country, representing over six and a half million people, and they support and allow campaigns like this and all the progressive things we're doing, they give them that support to enable all of us uh, to fight back. And we should feel as much as we can, not individual activists, but part of a collective movement for social justice in this country. Um, now, in that sense, we need to be linked as all we can, and many of you do this, to real world activism, whether that be in the workplace or on the streets, so we're not just an army of clicktivists. Now, we look at some of the campaigns over the last couple of years since this damn government has come to power and the, the use they've made of social media, whether it be the student protest who gave other people the confidence to fight back, whether it be UK Uncut, and I know some of you are in this room, who forced tax avoidance onto the agenda, an issue which just a couple of years ago was out on the fringes, just geeks and nerds would talk about it. And now everybody, even the Daily Mail, ended up giving that issue a platform because of the brave struggle of what they did, or whether it be Occupy and the way it forced people, it reminded us who caused this crisis and who's been made to pay for it. Now in the coming months, there are all sorts of activism which is going to be taking place and we online need to be doing everything we can to build for it. And I think in particular, for example, of the TUC's Future That Works demonstration on the 20th of October. Let's make sure that is even bigger than the March for the Alternative which is already the biggest workers' demonstration in a generation. Let's do all we can to build for movements like that. But equally, we've got to help, as I say, give a voice to people uh, and to their experiences, but to link together those struggles, whether it be disabled people having their benefits confiscated from them, whether it be the plight of the young unemployed. For example, now the number of young black people out of work is over half, whether it be part-time workers having their tax credits Confiscated, whether it be the privatisation of the NHS, which this government didn't have the guts to put to the electorate because they know they would have been massacred if they'd done so, whether it be attacks on workers' rights, like the multimillionaire donor and asset stripper Adrian Beecroft, who was commissioned to attack workers' rights, who called Vince Cable a socialist, which I think is the biggest smear against the good name of socialism <laughs> I have ever heard. But what we have to do is link together as best we can those struggles and to try and give a platform to them as best we can. And our job, and it goes for activists, whether it be online or on the streets or in the workplace, is to build pressure on those above and to create political space. And what I mean by that, if you take benefits, if you take welfare, you take the demonization of people who are unemployed or disabled, uh, because of that it has created fertile ground in public opinion for the attacks on the welfare state of this government. So we create political space by showing the reality of what the government is doing, which is a precondition to building opposition to it. Now, politics isn't a soap opera. It's not what happens above. All social change happens in this country because of people building pressure from below and struggling from below. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. That was Frederick Douglass a 19th century African-American statesman, and he was absolutely right. And that is our job, to help link into those struggles and to give them that platform and be part of that struggles as best we can. Now, I'm going to say, and I keep saying this, so some people are going to groan when they hear me say this, and that probably includes Ellie, but we are up against a government which is far weaker than other governments in the past, like Margaret Thatcher's government, which picked her opponents off one by one. This government, uh, the Tories, sorry, the election was handed to them on a plate.
They were up against one of the most unpopular Labour governments of modern times in an economic crisis more disastrous than anything since the 1930s. And I remember the last time the Tories won a general election, she's already heckling, uh, and I was seven years old. It was 1992, I remember it well because my teachers came dressed in black. But the last election, it was handed to them on a plate and they did not win. They don't have a mandate for transforming our society in the interests of the people at the top, which is exactly what they're doing, turning a crisis of the market into a crisis of public spending. There is no mandate for that. So if we can build and help build a movement, we can help show what's actually happening in our society as a result of austerity, then I think we can take on this government, we can defeat them, and we can contribute to building a society which is far more run in the interests of working people. So I hope when we have a few drinks and we go home after this weekend, we get ready for the battles ahead because there are many battles ahead, but they are battles we can win. Thank you.